Uh oh! This episode of Business Blaze is made possible by Audible. Visit audible.com slash blaze or text blaze to 500 500, but only do that if you're in the United States. Otherwise you could be texting. I have no idea what happens if I text 500 500 here, but uh, I'm not gonna get a free trial with Audible, so don't even try it. You'll have to go to audible.com forward slash blaze like a plebeian. This video is all about epic stuff. <laughs> I'm literally finding this out right now. It's about epic stories of disgruntled employees. This better not be all about you in the basement, Danny. We've talked about this. Even though, oh, what happens here, if, you, if you're wondering, you probably are, is Danny will write us a script, I will add some shit jokes, Sam will add some fine memes, and uh, that's what happens here. So let's do it. Even though I've rattled through a fair few jobs during my short life. Oh my God, Danny, have you ever? It's one of the most ongoing comment memes. I don't know if comment memes are a thing, but they are now, uh, is Danny's history. Everyone's like, Simon, make a biographics video about Danny. Simon, why don't you do a biographics video in the business place style of Danny? Simon, tell me about Danny. I mean, last, last video that I recorded, Danny just casually mentioned that he was off on business trips to the Philippines. And I was like, Danny, what's up? I like to think, that I've departed nearly all of them under quite pleasant terms. You're never departing this one, Danny! An ongoing meme if you're new, if you're wondering who I'm shouting at, Danny's not here. He's not even in this building. He's not even in this country. Uh, but there's an ongoing meme that he is locked in my basement. Uh, but there was one notable exception. Oh no, Danny, it's this one. <laughs> As Simon has asked me to write a script covering epic stories of disgruntled employees, I thought I would take this opportunity to turn the script into a 4,000 word resignation letter. <laughs> So, Simon, Danny, I know you're lying because I have another script for you right there, which you wrote after this one. And I'm recording right after this because it's December and I've got a lot of recording to do because every December advertisers are like, Simon, we need like 19 sponsor videos this month. And I'm like, okay, I like money, so I'm going to do it. But it's going to be a very stressful December and my family are going to miss me. So that Simon is forced to read out loud my reasons for quitting The Blaze and going to work for V- No, Danny, you can't work for Michael at Vsauce. I mean, you probably could. He's probably better to work for. He does seem like less of a dick than I. I've never met him, actually. Um, but he does, he, he does seem like a bit of a legend. And run through my allegations of false imprisonment, poor working conditions, and purposeful scripts uh, skipping. Yeah, don't get, don't get any ideas, Danny. You're like, employee. Please, Daddy, you're a slave at best. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I couldn't bear the thought of not being able to celebrate a traditional Christmas in the basement. <laughs> Besides, I think Vsauce only makes about one video a year now. <laughs> Danny throwing some shade at Michael. <laughs> but there was one genuinely edgy job exit. Oh wait, I read that wrong, didn't I? Let's try that again. But there was one genuinely edgy job exit that I passed through many years ago when I found myself accidentally sh stacking shelves in a South Yorkshire branch of Tesco. Danny and I have had similar jobs at different supermarkets. I used to stack shelves at Sainsbury's. I also, I'm having a real trouble with the script because uh, I apparently need to clean my print heads. <laughs> I knew I'd hate the job. It was meant to be a very quick stop gap position, but it dragged on for a couple of months longer than I intended. Well, that's not too bad. I mean, months fly by. I'm literally like, where is my life going? I don't, <laughs> this suddenly got very serious, but does anyone else feel it's like, what the f is going on? Life goes past, past really fast quickly. As we said on the last episode, this isn't the channel where we solve complex problems or moral quandaries. It's where we have a bit of a laugh. I probably didn't make the best of impressions on my first shift. I kicked off the morning by carelessly setting off all the fire alarms and finished the day by carelessly dropping a massive box of very expensive champagne on the floor where it all smashed to bits. That's coming out of your paycheck. And we mean we're taking your whole paycheck and you have to pay us on top of it because champagne is expensive. I remember I was working at Tesco and I, uh, it's Tesco, it's Sainsbury's. And I was like, I think I was 17. So I got like the 17 year old minimum wage, which at the time was about three pounds 80 an hour. And I remember there were a bottle of champagne, which was like 40 pounds. It wasn't, you know, reasonably, reasonable champagne, nothing like extraordinarily fancy. And it was like, oh my God, I would have to work 11 hours to pay for that one bottle of champagne. Three pounds 83 does sound terribly low, doesn't it? And this was 2003, 2004. I probably, um, the deputy manager of the store clearly didn't take to me, but he didn't seem to take to anyone else in the store either. I obviously won't name him here. No, actually I will. <laughs> His name was, Danny is throwing the shade all over the place today. His name was Trevor and he was a massive bellend and everyone hated him. All right, Trevor, you heard it here. He was the kind of guy who would be breathing down your neck at every turn, Chris criticizing your every move, and clearly relishing the mad power trip of being in charge of a few bananas and a few bananas and cabbages. Look, I mean, Business Blaze has 
what, maybe 100,000, 150,000 people who watch this episode uh, as of 2020. I think about 13% of them are in the UK, last time I checked. The chances of someone knowing, someone who knows, Trevor <laughs> Tesco store manager, deputy store manager, is not low, Danny. <laughs> Allegedly. And all of this is alleged. Maybe Trevor even a real person. I finally snapped when he invited me into his office for a serious chat about my future with the company. He started banging on about how I needed to make more of this fabulous opportunity I'd been given at Tesco, otherwise I might not be around for much longer. I don't think there was any going back when I suddenly burst out laughing while he was mid-sentence. I said, well, that's at least something you got right. Life's too short for this bollocks. Danny, please, you didn't do this. This is like what, this is like some American beauty style scene that plays out in your head of how you're going to quit your job but in reality you just slide a letter under the manager's door giving your two weeks notice and everything's very polite then i stood up to finally lit a cigarette in a strictly no smoking environment i hope it was a strand and uh exit out of the building for the very last time the sli automatic sliding doors took ages to open which kind of spoiled the dramatic effect a little bit but i was on my way to a much nicer life up the road global video where the smell of popcorn always hung sweetly in the air like an eternal butter kiss dream danny riding off into the sunset oh have you noticed i've moved i normally had a desk here in the past but i've moved it so i can roam more while I blaze. I, I like it. Normally at the Via Desca. Now I can go wherever I want. I can come very close to you, which might make you uncomfortable, and it definitely makes me go out of focus. Back we go. I realize this might not, might not sound like the most electrifying job departure ever to have taken place, but when we dig deeper into the cracking creak... Oh, it's f***ing printheads. Uh, creaking vaults of P45s and pink slips, we come across a breed of disgruntled employee who hatched a far more ambitious plan, far more ambitious plans for revenge and seemed determined to leave the building in a blaze of glory. Danny, if you really did this, you f***ing legend. Like, walking out, like, like, I don't know if you actually did light a cigarette. A f***ing baller ass move. Silence is golden. Even though I've had a Twitter account for over 10 years, I still feel fairly new to the platform, as I've only recently figured out how to tweet live from the basement. Yeah, well, we set Danny up with a very limited internet connection, like there's a lot of filtering, all, all of that kind of stuff. And until it's, it's why he has to make up most of the facts on Business Place. And until today, I would have probably have assumed that Donald Trump had the largest following on Twitter if I was ever asked the question in a pub quiz. It's got so much easier to amass a huge social media following when everyone in the world either loves you or hates you. But, in fact, with the poultry... Oh, God, the f***ing printheads. 89 million followers, maybe? Trump can only manage sixth place on the Twitter league table. He's not even as popular as Justin Bieber. He has 113 million followers. F***ing hell. Also, I'm fairly sure I've told this story on Business Place before. But I was like... I was like genuinely curious. I was like, what does Justin Bieber's music sound like? Because he is wildly successful. He has 130 million followers on social media. And I was like, I, and I don't listen to like, I don't go to clubs, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and I don't really get much exposure to popular music. The most exposure I get is when I go into a store and they're pumping out some like, <laughs> I'm like, what is this shit? So I was like, I went on to Spotify. I'm like, I'm going to listen to some Justin Bieber and see what this shit is all about. Also, the same thing happened and I haven't done it yet. I have no idea. What, what Billie Eilish is. Like, I keep seeing a recommended video on my homepage about Billie Eilish having an interview four years in a, ro in a row with, like, GQ, or not GQ, that would be weird, um, with, like, Vanity Fair. And I'm like, what is this about? And who is Billie Eilish? And I've never listened to her music, but uh, I, might, I might listen to it this afternoon, and I'll get back to you. I listened to Justin Bieber's music, expecting it to, you know, be not my cup of tea, but at least have some musical quality to it. Uh, it doesn't. And Trump must find it particularly annoying that sitting right at the very top of Twitter charts is his predecessor, Barack Obama, with 126 million followers. That is a lot of followers. But I'm sure this has kept Trump awake at night more than coronavirus, losing the election, and the loud grunge music coming from Melania's bedroom next door. There's a lot in there. Uh, Trump may be a prolific tweeter, but he went strangely quiet one evening in November of 2017 when his account completely disappeared for 11 whole minutes. It was quite a beautiful 11 minutes in which Trump found himself unable to post any insults or boasts or disputed claims, which we always used to call lies back in my day. It's <laughs> It's like, uh, what's the date? It's the 8th of November, uh, 8th of December. Trump is still saying you won this election. It's like, bro, 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 you didn't though, did you? <laughs> you just didn't. 
I mean, it was close, but you lost. There was initial speculation that Twitter had finally deactivated Trump's account for repeatedly violating the platform's terms and conditions, but this was never going to be the case as Twitter admitted in the past that his account is protected from deactivation on the grounds that his content is newsworthy. Have you seen what Trump tweets? I don't think news... I mean, I guess it's newsworthy by the fact of him being the US president, but it's like... It is such bollocks. The platform originally claimed that the accounts had been deactivated due to human error, but it later transpired that German citizen calls ba ba hell ba ba bayata ba ba batia Dysak, who worked in Twitter's trust and safety division, had flagged the account for deactivation as a parting gesture on his very last day of working for the company. Amazing. Uh, it's amazing that someone who's got fired from Twitter or whatever, or de de departed, sounds like he got fired, um, can actually do that. Although hailed as a hero by some, uh, da Dysak later claimed that he was just following company policy and had just assumed that somebody higher up the chain would overrule the request. But it's not entirely clear why he would even bother triggering the process if he felt genuinely that it wasn't going to lead anywhere. When Trump's... Yeah, dude, that just sounds like a weak ass. You don't have to make an excuse. They can't fire you twice. When Trump's account was restored, the president tranquilly tweeted, My Twitter account was taken down for 11 minutes by a rogue employee. I guess the word must finally be getting out and having an impact. What word? What impact? What are you talking about? It's like Trump tweets. It's like, you initially read them. And if you're pro-Trump, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you look at them, you're like, that doesn't make sense. So there was naturally a comical response to this tweet from some quarters, including my favorite. Those few precious minutes were like when Andy played the opera record over the Shawshank PA, PA system. Mmm. Mwah! I would do the chef's kiss, but both my hands are full. Meanwhile, former Republican Congressman David Jolly called for the unlikely hero to be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. All right, steady on, guys. Taking it too far, old boy. Uh, this video, you know what you're not taking too far? That makes no sense. Today's sponsor is Audible. Look, you've heard me talk about Audible before on this channel, on my other channels, literally all of them, and possibly on every other channel on YouTube because it's Audible. They sponsor everything. <laughs> Audible, in case you didn't know, you do. It has the largest selection of audiobooks in the world bar none. It's a great resource for absorbing a book without having to sit down in front of the hearth crack it open, smell those dusty pa- oh, I'm really just selling books now, aren't I? But I mean, look, the reality is, as nice as it is to sit down with a book in front of a hearth and be like, oh yes, oh pages, oh typed words. <laughs> the reality is most of us are busy. <laughs> And it's like we mostly just, you know, drive places, walk places, go places, around. You know, you've got to listen to audiobooks. It's more efficient. Like, I am always listening to audiobooks. Oh, I have an old recommendation in here, but I've actually been listening to a different book than what I'm recommending. I'm listening to a book called, uh, Jesus Christ, I can't even remember the title. It's by Ray Dalio, who's this famous investor. Uh, Principles. It is fantastic. The problem, the one problem with audiobook, audiobooks, and it is one problem, is that every time you pick up a regular book, you see the front cover and you see the author and the title and you can always remember it. But with an audiobook, you just click play and start listening and you're like, you forget what the title of the book is. But it's called Principles. It's by Ray Dalio. It's, it's fantastic. Like, I guess you have to be a bit into business and stuff if, if you're into, like, if you, if you would be into that book, but it's really good. Oh, also, like, generally, you've heard all of this before, because, I mean, <laughs> look, you're probably skipping ahead being like, I know about Audible, Simon! <laughs> I know about Audible! I've seen a million! <laughs> But there's actually new stuff on Audible, which is pretty great. They've got a premium membership package called Audible Plus, which is all the great perks of Audible, which is that, uh, you know, you get a book every 30 days, choose from thousands, world biggest selection, blah, 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 blah. But with Audible Plus, you get, what, well, what is it exactly? There's a whole bunch of them. One, you get, uh, you don't, you can get podcast content with all of the ads stripped out, which is obviously nice because no one likes ads interrupting their content. Am I right? <laughs> Also, you get access to a huge selection of audiobooks, like as many as you want, sort of like the buffet version, which is obviously not all of Audible's audiobooks, but it is a lot. I was looking through and I went on like popular searches on Audible. And it was like, I was just like, wow, the like Audible listeners are diverse because it's like popular searches. And it's like, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And the book next to it is like some hardcore erotic fiction. And I'm like, can't say they're not diverse. So anyway, you can get, uh, you can take advantage of Audible Plus 
I got news for you. Oh, we do, do we? You get Audible Plus for just $4.95 a month. That is an extraordinary deal. Oh, it even says it. With this amount of content, it's a total steal. I completely agree. It is. It's incredibly good. Audible is the best. Go get it now. Go to audible.com slash blaze. Or as I said at the beginning, if you're in America, text blaze to 500 500. Audible! Probably never heard an ad read for Audible like that. Just screaming it. Audible! Blueprint for destruction. Some employees take the time and effort to try and gently break the news that your services are no longer required. But others apply a bit less thought and consideration. I don't know, I, I think any time I've quit a job, <laughs> I've never done it in person. I've always just sent an email or written a letter. And you, the thing with letters is, right, like it doesn't, you're like, nope, that's the, you're, I'm always like, that's the professional way to do it. You should put it in a letter and leave it on your boss's desk. Explain your thoughts, ask politely for a reference. And I'm like, it just happens, but it's also the coward's way. <laughs> Perfect. In the case of Maria Loop Cooley from Jacksonville in Florida. Oh no, Florida woman. She first discovered that she was losing her office job at Stephen E. Hutchins Architects in 2008 when she just happened to recognize the company's telephone number at the bottom of an ad in the local newspaper, which was seeking candidates to fill her own position. Oh, that is brutal. Oh, Maria was so upset about this. She took the decision to sneak into the office early on a Sunday morning and permanently delete seven years worth of architectural drawings and blueprints from the computers. Oh, Stephen E. Hutchins Architects, you need backblaze. Uh, worth about $2.5 million in total. It didn't take the law long to catch up with Murray, as there was no sign of forced entry. The alarms had been disarmed, and it turns out that she was the only employee in the office, aside from Stephen E. Hutchins himself, who had access to all the files. Ah, uh, is she gonna go to prison? $2.5 million lost of lost records is a lot. I don't think so. I don't think so. Marie, who was sentenced to five years probation, okay, so she didn't go to prison, and ordered to pay damages of $1,000 to Hutchins for physical damage to the computers, but it's not clear if Hutchins had backed up any of the $2.5 million worth of missing files. I'm not sure if that place was around like back then. Danny and I, same page. Uh, okay, so I'd say she got off fairly light. And wait, it is also their fault, like the company's fault. It's like, wait, you have like seven years and $2.5 million worth of architectural drawings and you haven't backed them up. That's kind of on you, Steve-o. Funnily enough though, it turns out that Marie was the architect of her own downfall and job dismissal. The advertisement in the paper was for a new position up for grabs of the company belonging to the wife of Stephen Hutchins. And Marie's own job had never been in danger in the first place. Oh no! Marie! Slippery slope to the job center. Where, when the, oh god, these print heads. When the JetBlue flight 1052 from Pittsburgh touched down at JFK Airport on the 9th of August 2010, the passengers listened attentively to a new message piping over the intercom. The voice belonged to flight attendant Stephen Slater, who had spent 28 years in service and was clearly a respected figure within the company. He was chairman of the JetBlue's Uniform Redesign Committee, so you clearly didn't want him to, to, you didn't want to mess with the big shit, this big cheese. But Stephen sounded a bit grumpy over the intercom on this particular day. He screamed, to the f***ing asshole who told me to f*** off. It's been 28 good years. I've had it. That's it. <laughs> oh my god. Wait, I feel like we should do this in the captain's voice. See, the fucking asshole man told me to f off. It's been 28 years. I've had it. That's it. Why do all pilots sound the same? <laughs> Why is that about? Like, every single one always sounds like this. Ladies and gentlemen, we. Maybe, I mean, British. British. It's like nasally. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be arriving at our destination shortly. Please buckle your seatbelts, lay your trays in the upright position, and raise the window shutters. Why? It's like they learn that voice. I bet when they're when they're off the radio. And close the shutters. He puts it down. He like says to the co-pilot, "All right, Tomo, nose down. We're taking her home." <laughs> At this point, flight attendant Stephen Slater grabbed two beers from the galley, and I'm sure what must go down in history is one of the most dramatic resignations ever. He activated the plane's inflatable emergency evacuation chute and slid all the way down it with beers in hand before strolling over to his vehicle in the employee parking lot and driving away from his long career in the airline industry. Dude, I mean, is everyone called Stephen in this video? But Stephen, you're gonna have to pay for that because I'm sure those, uh, like, when you activate those slides, that sh be expensive. Stephen later claims that a nuisance female passenger had repeatedly ignored instructions to remain seated until the plane landed. She insisted on standing up and tried to pull down her luggage until she accidentally whacked Stephen in the face with it. She then allegedly held abuse at Stephen when he asked for an apology. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with people on planes? Just sit the f 
down. Do what you're told. Why are you standing up, woman? The problem with this story is that it wasn't corroborated by any other passenger on board. Yes, even going to be witnesses. And the Port Authority police concluded that the entire confrontation had been fab fabricated. It certainly sounds as if Stephen Medev had a few issues uh, at the time relating to alcohol abuse and health. But it was actually a pretty dangerous and reckless way to make an exit. The giant inflatable side is obviously only meant to be used as a last resort in an emergency situation. And it hits the ground pretty quickly. Anyone on the ground at the time could potentially be injured or even killed by the evacu- eva uh, by the activation. And it's actually a pretty expensive way to leave the plane tears. It costs about $10,000 to repack. <laughs> F love it! This is like straight out of a movie. Like, he grabs the viz. I'm out, bitches! <laughs> Stephen eventually agreed to a plea bargain, smart, in which he avoided prison. Jesus Christ, he could have gone to- I guess he could have gone to prison. You're endangering people's lives by pleading guilty to a misdemeanor charge of attempted fourth-degree mischief. What the f is fourth-degree mischief? What the f first-degree mischief? He served a year on probation which was and was ordered to undergo counseling and drug testing and paid back the $10,000 cost of repacking the fun slide in, in bite-sized monthly chunks. <laughs> Which was difficult because he was really unemployable from that point on. Weirdly, he later claimed that his actions were meant to be interrupted, interpreted as a resignation. He was hoping to resume his duties at JetBlue as soon as possible. Good luck with that, mate. <laughs> JetBlue had other ideas, though. And since then, the Uniform Redesign Committee has had to make do with another chairman. How will they ever make do without the hero that is Stephen? A poor choice of words. Life's more fun when you live in the moment. That's, that's certainly true, but it also means you're in for a fairly bleak future. It's like, I'm not going to work today. I'm going to shoot black tar heroin next Monday. Now I don't have a job anymore and I'm addicted to black tar heroin. That's the corporate slogan for the American multimedia messaging app Snapchat, which currently boasts 229 million active users, although I'm not sure most of them are under the age of 13. <laughs> Snapchat is such a piece of shit. Like, I get social media. Like, people complain about Facebook. I don't really like Facebook, but I get it. I definitely get Instagram. I definitely get Twitter. Although it just seems to be... I like... People complain about Twitter being filled with horrible people. And it's kind of like... I think most of my interaction on Twitter is fairly positive. But there are some right dickheads on there. And I mean, I'm definitely adding to the pile of dickheads. But there's another memorable slogan associated with Snapchat, which was never really intended to catch on. Snapchat is for rich people. Wait, it's not. It's for 13-year-olds. The quote was attributed to co-founder and CEO Evan Spiegel uh, as a response to a question from the new head of growth from the company during a meeting in 2015. New boy, Anthony... Pompliano has inquired why Snapchat wasn't going to expand to potentially lucrative geographies, but Evan is alleged to have cut him short with the words, "The app is this app is for rich people. I don't want to expand to poor countries like India and Spain." What? Is this some sort of peasant joke that I'm too rich to understand? Considering that the app has a lot already had a large, ever-growing base in India, it was a peculiar response to a peculiar question. And when the quote became public. The response from Indian users was swift and brutal. What a surprise. Campaigns quickly sprung up, which encouraged Indian users to uninstall the app immediately, while the iStore and Google Play Store suddenly became riddled with negative one-star reviews on Snapchat. The share price of the company took a rapid nosedive, which wasn't helped when a group of anonymous hackers from India claimed they had leaked the personal data of 1.7 million Snapchat users onto the dark web as a direct response to Evan's quote. <laughs> it's brutal. This was later revealed to be a hoax. I mean, good, I guess, because that's just on 1.7 million people rather than the company itself. But the scandal hardly helped to restore confidence in the company's share price. Of course, Snapchat ultimately recovered from this unfortunate choice of words, but it now seems quite unlikely that Evan even said them in the first place. The quote has actually appeared in a lawsuit filed by the, uh, against the company by Anthony Pompliano, who lasted mere three weeks instead of growth before being fired for poor performance. That, that seems a bit harsh. You fire him after three weeks, it's like, how much was he supposed to do? You were supposed to turn this company around, Tony! We gave you three weeks, asshole! And then that doesn't really seem fair. I mean, three weeks is not a long time to turn a large company around, especially after you've been- Ouch! Anthony claimed Snapchat had been deliberately misleading investors. Uh-oh. By exaggerating the growth metrics, retention rates, and other key metrics of the app. Uh-oh! <laughs> Snapchat denied all the allegations. Allegedly. Snapchat denied all the allegations. And that's just it. They were just allegations, allegedly. Double negative. So I'll add another one, allegedly, including that damaging quote attributed to Evan and insist that Anthony was just a disgruntled employee who had been misinformed about the numbers and was fired for being crap at his job. They may well have been telling the truth. The lawsuit was ultimately thrown out of court and Anthony moved to a nice job at Brighton Labs, whom he also tried and failed to sue for wrongful termination. Crook by nature. Crook by name. Crook by nature. Here's a dilemma faced only by the angriest of employees who are determined to exact their revenge on a company in a manner so savage 
it's downright illegal. Ideally, you don't want to get caught when you're breaking the law. Pro tip. So you don't want to make it obvious that you're the one behind the crime. But the problem with committing a random and anonymous act of revenge upon your former employees is that they never know it was you who had the last laugh, and that's the point. <laughs> uh, it's all very well stuffing dead fish into certain poles of the office so that the company eventually has to evacuate the premises because of an overpowering smell that can't, they can't even locate or identify, but they'll never be given an opportunity to reflect on their own actions which led to this deep sea shit show. And you'll never get that satisfying feeling that justice has been explicitly served from the wronged party. Wayne Crook, interesting name, uh, was clearly wrestling with this conundrum after he got fired from his job in the UK at the Bristol Flying Centre in 2012. Wayne had lost his job after he was found to have moved an, air moved an aircraft in a hangar without permission, a task that he wasn't even qualified to do. Although he had originally started the ball rolling on a tribunal, he eventually accepted a settlement before the case could ever be heard. But it appears that Wayne later had a change of heart and felt insulted about the size of the settlement, which he agreed to, Wayne. <laughs> what the f**k? So he decided to return to work for a surprise night shift, armed with a massive hammer and a grim sense of determination. Oh boy, planes are expensive. This is gonna get expensive. And it's clear that he was ready to take full credit for whatever happens. <laughs> yeah, I remember there was... this is... <laughs> At school, I remember we had an art lesson and we were carving, you know, where you have like the lino and you have to carve out a pattern and then you screen print the pattern. And it's like uh, a kid in my class was called, well, I won't share his full name, but his first name was Andy and his second name started with an M. And he carved into the desk Andy M. Like there were these brand new, really nice, big like art desks. And he just straight up just carved his name like Andy M into the desk. And it's like, bro, what do you expect is going to happen? There's going to be some other NDM who had a class that morning. There were like 13 people in my class. They're going to know it's you, bro. This was also the same kid who always was at the bottom of the class. So no matter how badly you did, like I was terrible at French, but I was I always I always knew that Andy M was going to do worse than me. So it would always be like, you know, 12th out of 13, Simon W. Well, I can tell you my last name, Simon Whistler. And there'd be like 13 NDM. I'd be like, uh, so he smashed everything to pieces. This included 40 office windows, 35 computer monitors, every single toilet and sink in the building, until it reached a point where water was flooding out of the building in every direction. He also popped outside for a bit to smash a few vehicles in the car park before stepping back inside to empty the fire extinguishers and smash a few more television sets. Dude, there's airplanes! Smash the airplanes! I mean, like, good job, you know, computers and stuff. Yeah, that's expensive. You know what they're not as expensive as? planes. Finally, just like an artist signing his latest masterpiece, Wayne decided to apply the perfect finishing touch to his handiwork by scrolling the words gross misconduct on the office walls in blood. It's not entirely clear where the blood came from. What is going on? They got crazy. Naturally, the police didn't have to look very far for potential suspects. In fact, they apprehended Wayne a few days later when he was found staggering along the A38 reeking of alcohol. A38's like a, a major road, not like a motorway or a highway as the Americans would call them, but like the next biggest type. So you are legally allowed to walk on them, but I mean, it's not the best experience. I remember once I was on a bike ride in France and I accidentally rode onto a motorway. <laughs> I was going around and around, but I got off and I didn't realize that I was on a motorway. I was just cycling along and everyone starts beeping at me. And then I'm like, am I on a motorway? And so I get off my bike and I'm just walking along the hard shoulder of a ever to get off this motorway. And everyone's beeping at me and it's like, I know, I know. <laughs> You think I did this on purpose, French people? When they asked if he was all right, Wayne responded, no, I'm suicidal, I'm going to promote myself in front of the next bus. Then he paused thoughtfully before adding, you want to speak to me anyway? I smashed up the flying center. I did it with a hammer. Wayne was later charged with burglary and criminal damage and served 20 months in prison for the 175,000 pounds worth of damage that he had inflicted. Ah. A chief executive from the Bristol Flying Center later publicly noted that from our point of view, it was a very bad experience. That is the most British thing ever. <laughs> It's like, uh, how do you feel about this business that had nearly 200 grand's worth of damage done? Mm, wasn't a very good experience, was it? But maybe Wayne derived some long-term satisfaction from the feeling that he had at least made some kind of point. And it makes me wish that I'd thought of it bigger when I walked out of Tesco for that last, that last time with a cigarette in my mouth. With hindsight, I should have, uh, at very least, run over to the public address system and screamed, 
putting a bell in before grabbing a couple of cans of Heineken and bouncing off to the into the sunset on a space hopper. That, Danny, what you did was already legendary. You don't need to be more legendary than that. This has been an episode of Business Blaze. I have been your boy with the blaze. This video is brought to you by Audible. There is a link to Audible below. You'll also find a link to PurchTheMerch.co where you can purchase this certified legend t-shirt. By purchasing it, I'm officially bestowing upon you the certification of legend. And as always, thank you for watching. Oh, the